I, I love that they do this now at the beginning too. You get this little mm -hmm. automatic message, but uh, yeah. people that, that are watching this on video, if you didn't know, you get a little recording that says this, this meeting is now being recorded. Hello, hi to everybody. Um, I'll be admitting people into the chat here, but um, here with Michael, uh, Michael Chicago. Did I, I, I didn't even catch that one. Did I say your last name correctly? You, you did. It's, it's the easiest way to remember is pistachio. You know, rhymes with pistachio. That's how everybody remembers it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, I, it's, I, I think it's kind of hard to mess up uh, Fernandez. Um, I was gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna say it like my name is is for for Nundas or something like that, but that just it wasn't as funny as it, it wasn't my end. Um, so I'm here, we're we're here. Michael is here. Uh, we're gonna be talking to you all about dog aggression related issues, um, and uh, uh, that's pretty much my intro. So Michael, I'll, I'll let you start it off. Yeah, you know, I'm excited for this because uh, Eddie is somebody that um, knows a lot about ABA, obviously, and it's something that I've studied, but certainly not on any kind of academic level. So I was a little intimidated actually to do this interview because I know that the technical language I'm, I've got to remember and actually know what it means sometimes. So I'm excited <laughs> to do that. But it also made me kind of reflect on, I'm sure there's, I know there's a lot of trainers in here, but I, I see a lot because I see a lot of familiar names and just how we have to it made me reflect on that, like our journey as trainers and learning about all these different things and how uh, ABAs kind of really um, come into the dog training world, which is a good thing. But we also have to get good at well, understanding a lot of the other sciences. And unless we have an actual degree or, you know, an advanced degree in those sciences, we're kind of extrapolating what we get from folks like Eddie doing the studies and the research and, and uh, you know, feeding that information down to us trainers. Uh, and it just makes me th think about all the sciences that we have to understand. So not just ABA, but things like ethology or maybe even the medical model when we're looking at, especially for work with aggression in dogs, we've got to really have a grasp, at least a somewhat of a grasp on each of those sciences to be good at what we're going to do. And that's not an easy thing to do especially when the information's kind of trickling down in different ways so there's no like formal like you know dog training university where you get your your good academic foundation in ethology or aba we're pulling it in from all these different areas of the internet and um so uh kudos to everybody who is doing that because uh, and to the whole community as uh, you know, in terms of disseminating this information all from the academics uh, onto us trainers. So, you know, I always equate myself like I'm just like, I'm kind of a grunt in the field, taking what I've learned from the academics and, and the research and what they're passing to us and applying it. So, you know, that applied part of the behavior analysis comes into play with what all of us are doing when we're working as trainers and consultants. And, um, you know, it's so, that's that's got kind of where I'm at in this conversation. I hope that makes sense. And then um, and I'm going to be definitely picking Eddie's brain as well <laughs> as we go yeah. along, because I know he's got a lot to offer. So, yeah, no, that's 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 awesome. I, I'll tell you one of the the big reasons why I was really uh, excited to chat with you about this topic in particular, Michael, is because um, I, I was actually talking to uh, my my lab. Uh, well, the lab I'm part of. That's a probably more appropriate description. So Animal Behavior Welfare uh, and Anthrozoology Lab, which is out of University of Adelaide in, all, in Australia, um, which I am not in Australia yet. That may come up at a later point, but many people <laughs> have already heard all the things with that. But I, I was talking to them a little bit about, um, because uh, our lab does a lot of companion animal work. Um, not, not myself, I'm not in Australia right now, um, mm -hmm. but the lab, many of the, that's that's the primary focus and we were talking a little bit about ag aggression issues in dogs um and i said one of the fantastic things about what you do is you help take a lot of the the uh emotional uh aspects of it out of the equation not not the emotion itself for the dogs um i don't want to say negating the emotion but the fact that there are uh there's so many so much heated discussion arguments, feelings involved, and you really help, I, I think, uh, provide a, an objective view um, and applications uh, to this that uh, is really, it's wonderful to see. Um, this is, a, it's a difficult topic. You know, yeah. yeah. And I say it all the time, you know, it's, it's really, 
you know, we work, we get into this profession because we like dogs, we want to help dogs. But um, then we realize it's really about the people and coaching the people. But then yeah. when you get into aggression cases, it's almost all about the people because, you know, the, the behavior change strategies are going to look very similar in many of the cases. I mean, and we can get into that in our discussion here, but, but the behavior change is it's, it's the same thing. It's rinse and repeat when you're dealing with a lot of aggression cases. It's yeah. the dynamic of the people and the emotions involved and navigating those conversa conversations that changes so much uh, with each case. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a really, uh, I, I think that is an incredibly helpful perspective to be able to get people to, to talk as um, uh, objectively as, as treating this topic with the, the, the seriousness that it, it necessarily uh, needs, but without, uh, I don't know, what's the proper description I'm looking for here, without people having to be heated in, in a discussion about it, without them having, you know, we can be passionate about the topic and we can be concerned about it, mm -hmm. but we don't have to be argumentative. We don't have to, uh, uh, be aversive ourselves. Um, and that's an interesting part. That's something that uh, I, I'll throw out this little bit that I think is interesting. This was one of the very early in my undergraduate education in behavior analysis. This was one of the topics that caught my eye as being so important from a behavior analytic perspective. Because one of the very first things uh, that I read, in fact, I think it was in Pearson Epling's first edition, what's now Pearson Cheney, um, their uh, behavior analysis and learning text, uh, which I don't remember what the Pearson Epling's first edition of that text, but uh, I think even in the first edition, um, if it, 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 they they had a, a section titled "Aggression Breeds Aggression," um, and I just went through their fifth edition of Pearson Cheney, and they have an updated version of the section. But I remember reading these studies, these laboratory studies, and then how it tied into applied research. And this whole perspective that, that behavior analysis brought to it where they said, let's look at these variables in as objective of a way as we can. Let's look at what are the things that lead to aggression? How do we, um, how, how is this behavior produced? How do we understand it? How do we change it? Um, and that just blew my mind because of how often you heard this, this topic discussed in a way that didn't feel very scientific because of so much of the emotion involved that instead it was, it, it, it was part of what produced aggression, breeding aggression in a certain sense. So yeah, just, just, the, just that label, that construct of aggression is right. an emotional topic and it, and it brings out a lot of feelings. Somebody actually posted today, Patricia McConnell, Dr. Patricia McConnell uh, mm -hmm. wrote an article on, um, uh, I don't know if it's an older article, or just a recent one, but about anger in dogs, the emotion of anger and why people get so upset when they hear about anger in dogs. And some people are like, no, that doesn't, yeah, dogs can't get angry, but dogs can get angry, you know? And um, right. it's one of those loaded terms that we don't want to apply to our beloved companions. Um, so that's why immediately just saying the word aggression or calling a dog aggressive or using that label, uh, you're already dealing with emotions most of the time, at least getting some sort of emotional response out of the human because it's such a loaded term in our society. And the same thing with anger, especially if we start applying it to, you know, some uh, an animal that we care about and love and wouldn't ever think they would get angry at us. But those, a lot of those human emotions are the same with our dogs, right? The, the, everything, and you could probably speak about this, you know, in terms of the structure of the brain and the neurological aspects, it's very similar. So to say that dogs can't get angry um, is unfortunately a little misguided, I think, um, you know, especially yeah. if we talk about the context in which it can happen. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, so all of these things at the end, I, I think that is part of what can help uh, contribute to some of the emotionality that's involved in this discussion too, which is when you see that there are, uh, when, for instance, if somebody comes to me and says, well, I'm seeing aggressive behavior and I stop and I say, okay, well, what does that look like? You know, or, or if somebody uses something like an emotional construct and they say, well, the animal is angry. And I say, okay, well, what does that look like? I'm, I, I, am, I am hopefully not taking away from that experience uh, by doing that. I'm not meaning to 
uh, uh, patronize or 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 belittle that the importance of that situation, but rather say, hey, how can we talk about this so that we are communicating in a way that's most effective for us to produce effective change? And and that is ultimately, but I can, un it's easy to understand how, uh, I mean, I'm empathetic, incredibly empathetic to, to this plight of people saying, well, I feel like this is not helping me. Uh, I feel like you're, you're 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 treating this situation as if uh, it's not as important. I that by no means the language is just meant to actually help facilitate the change that we hope to produce, so we can understand aggression a little bit better. So that's that's a component of the behavior ease as we're talking about here. So if somebody says, "Well, the dog's angry," I may stop and say, "Okay, well, how are we going to define that? What do we mean by this dog is angry in that sense? What is the dog doing?" And then we can go from there. Exactly, because it can go on up either side, right? Too. So sometimes they are saying my dog's angry or stubborn or you know, applying all of these labels, and then we have to ask them. We have to ask them to sort of operationalize what that looks like. But yeah. on the and then on the other side of the coin, they, they don't want to hear any of those you know labels put on their dog. So that's again the the sort of the art of the consulting side of the of these cases is uh determining that as the trainer or the consultant sitting there with the client is to get that information out of a client how they're feeling about that dog without eroding the relationship or the trust i'm trying to build with that client uh and, and so empathy is the is the really the key you know is if your if your responses are empathetic and the client sees that you're listening and truly being empathetic uh with with what they're telling you that's the road into getting that information. And so I'm also often able to start to extract some of that, how they're feeling about their dog. Um, and then just as kind of a side note on the consulting side of things, I, I wait for a little bit before I start trying to extract that information. I, the first 20, 30 minutes of the consultation uh, is as unemotional as it can be until I build a little rapport and trust and then we get into the emotional stuff. So I actually don't ask about any of the bites that happened or any of the aggressive incidents. We're talking about, all the other stuff. What does the dog like to eat? You know, what's the dog's age? Where'd you get the dog from? Why'd you get the dog? What do you enjoy to do with your dog? And all those questions, typical yeah. questions we have to ask on the his history anyways, show me around your house, you know, show me what the environment looks like, those kind of things. Then I'll say, okay, so tell me about the first time your dog bit. And that's after I've, you know, started to build that relationship so they can trust me and giving me that information. I think that's yeah. a very important thing to do when in aggression cases, extremely important to do. That's that's really uh, that's pretty amazing to hear too. That is something that I would completely miss, which, by the way, is why I'm often not a consultant. <laughs> it's certainly not, not, not with, uh, working with pet owners, but I wouldn't. I, I I would immediately want to go to the topic of of trying to um, measure, define, observe the behaviors in some way, and that's such an important component to it, um, which is funny because then it, that's similar to something that I do when I show up, especially when I'm talking to uh, curators, to managers, to keepers, since a lot of my work ends up being with zoos, that I I, I, I immediately go into that rapport building um, uh, exercise. And so it's just funny that the, the, the two different contexts, I didn't translate one to another setting. You know, it did not generalize my, I didn't think at least, uh, my my own uh, internal verbal behavior did not generalize the <laughs> context, so yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, yeah, so I, I I think the behavior ease and we could we could talk plenty about. I'm, there's going to be bits of behavior ease thrown in here uh, mm -hmm. throughout this chat. Um, I know one of the things that you were interested in talking about with with respect to aggression was in terms of elicitation and um, just eliciting uh, aggression. So I was curious to hear your take on this. And what yeah, yeah, we can unpack this quite a bit. Um, I think one of the biggest questions you get uh, any of the trainers and consultants, especially listening, is you know why is my dog behaving this way? Right. What? What's why? I don't understand why. I don't understand why my dog's being aggressive. Or maybe they do, but they need help further understanding it. So, um, you know, I think what we, what I like to try to do with clients is really educate them about contexts that happen, the, the antecedent arrangements. What? What? 
you know, it's rather than trying to first unpack the underlying emotions involved, um, I try to help them become very good at recognizing when in what situation, what are the conditions in which their dog might display aggressive behavior, because it's very important to do that first and foremost, so they can manage it and prevent it from happening again. Because yeah. aggression is very expensive, not only from the, the biological standpoint, but from a client and relationship standpoint, aggression or uh, aggressive incidents takes a significant toll out of their relationship oftentimes. So the first yeah. thing I have to do is teach them how to uh, manage things, which most people are pretty good at, but they also have to get good at recognizing the contexts in which aggressive behaviors might happen and so you educate them on like uh, let's use an example for instance a dog that guards um certain objects or toys you know so growls when somebody goes near their bone or their toys um the client might not recognize other contexts in which that might happen and so maybe we start to see some generalized guarding behavior the dog's guarding like starts to guard the dog beds but they hasn't surfaced yet and so the client uh starts to go to the dog bed without thinking through that because they don't know about that kind of sort of cross-pollination of resources sometimes and that's when the next aggressive incident happens so it's really important for us as trainers and consultants is to educate them recognize contexts right um, yeah and that's where that eliciting uh, where they start to recognize what can elicit that sort of behavior um second thing then and we can un dig a little deeper here is to um well I should I should back up for a second. You know, obviously they have to also recognize when their dog is communicating that they are about to display aggressive behavior because everybody's recognizing the growling, snarling, snapping, and biting, but they don't recognize the subtle signs. So we focus a lot on body language and communication between the client and the dog and recognizing when that dog is stressed or um, displaying some of the more subtle signals. So that's that's part of that package, right? Recognize the context, but recognize when your dog is telling you this is a context in which I might display aggression. So yeah. really important. But then we get into the underlying motivations and we and i know that's a whole other topic we can talk about but the motivating operations you know things right. that the reason why the dog is doing what they're doing and here's the thing with aggressive behavior the vast majority of aggressive behavior there's some underlying motivation there there's something it's, it's a little bit uh deeper than if i'm working with some of the other behavior issues um which were sort of much more operant aspect to it we're often dealing with something that sort of Again, I'm using lots of behavior here, but driving or motivating that behavior, you know, it's the yeah. fuel behind that. And most aggression cases, I have to unpack that or at least help the client understand why their dog is doing that. That way, it removes some of the emotions from uh, perhaps conflict in their relationship or them feeling uh, certain negativity towards their dog. Because once they understand, you know, my dog is has some fear-based responses to this stimulus, or they're frustrated, or they're angry, or they're in pain, um, or, or there's stress or anxiety, all of these underlying motivations that can happen. They have to understand that because they have to be able to recognize that. And the yeah. way to recognize that is through, of course, body language and behavior patterns, but really important for them to recognize that as well. So I find aggression cases are a little different than like some of the other types of behavior cases or uh, uh, training cases we might take like dog pulling on leash or dog jumping up on the counters for stealing mm -hmm. sandwiches, things like that. Fairly straightforward, singular um, motivations there, uh, not necessarily a negative underlying emotional response happening. Right. But aggression, we've got to help them unpack that because if we don't, we if we don't understand it ourselves, first we might give them the wrong treatment plan. But they also have to recognize and understand their their animal and their dog as well uh, to be able to help them. So those are kind of the two things I really focus on when I'm um, trying to help them understand like the eliciting events that you were just talking about. Yeah, yeah. There's there's interest. You know, when when you see the way, there's some interesting ways that behaviors have typically talked about aggression. Um, and there, there's some, so one of the broadest distinctions that's often made, and you'll see this in most behavioral texts, is this idea of, of differentiating between uh, reflexive versus operant aggression. Um, so, which, yeah, so reflexive, it's sometimes used synonymously with respondent aggression. And so the, the simple, the, the simplest illustration I have, and I was about to say, I'm going to, um, this is a, I have to do this for, for Sonia. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, I, I made the joke on, on your 
while I do, I, I actually do always have two penguins on my desk. Um, so at least two. So here's here's my uh, my examples here. But if we're talking about now, in this case, let's let's pretend these aren't penguins for a second. If we're just talking about eliciting and and the respondent event, uh, we're, we're we do have similar uh, stimuli as you were talking about there, right? So we have eliciting stimuli and then stimuli that set the occasion for some response. So what's the difference? Well, in reflexive, if we're talking about re reflexive behavior in general, let alone reflexive aggression, we're talking about something is elicited in that case. So, you know, uh, this this penguin comes over, bites this penguin, and the penguin's immediate response is to bite back or something like that. We could say that that response may be reflexive, um, whereas the operant aggression component is that this that response, in some sense, the stimulus sets the occasion for it. it's a discriminative stimulus for the behavior, and then that is somehow rewarded in some way or consequated. I should be more specific because there's potential punishment involved, right? So there's often the assumption that there's some combination of the two, and that's I think part of what you're talking about there. The difficulty, the difference between dealing with so much other operant behavior is you have the stuff that's just being elicited, and then also setting the occasion for these other behaviors. So why is the animal engaging in the aggression to begin with? Well, because it's turning off the aversive event in the other animal, right? So they're punishing this other response potentially in another organism mm -hmm. by biting. Right, they're getting that aversive stimulus away, and they're being that response in them is being negatively reinforced. So punish the other organism, display bite, mm -hmm. punish that response that they were in do that they were doing, which was aversive to them. It turns that one off, and then therefore the biting is negatively reinforced. That's part of the trick. And on top of that, then you have so things like species specific uh, uh, species specific defense responses, like what Bowles has talked about, SSDR is saying this is all tied into how the species responds and particular. Why did they learn to do this to begin with? How is that related to that species? So you've got the you you've got the entire uh, the the entire kitchen sink involved in there. So I cannot imagine uh, that sounds like one of the most difficult situations to be in is how how do you treat aggression when you know that you have un, you have unconditioned elicited stimuli that are species specific that are dog related right mm -hmm. it's very typical you have conditioned elicited stimuli right so now just the presence of the other dog starts to produce some of that response and then also the operant components of those same stimuli setting the the occasion for them to engage in this response because they've been negatively reinforced by the animal going away or the or the person going away so yeah yeah i love this I, conversation I, yeah, <laughs> this i'm throwing so all good. this up yeah this i'm throwing so all good. this yeah i'm throwing all this out there to say that seems like such a, a difficult thing to try to deal it, with. It is, because we don't always know. We, we make our educated guesses, and that's really what it is about, is making these educated observations of what might be going on with the behavior of the animal. And yeah. so what I, I suggest, at least for my students to do, too, is to put on, a, put on a, one lens at a time. So I'm going to put on my Pavlovian lens first maybe with some dogs and say, is this a reflexive response? Is this something that's been conditioned? Um, is there some sort of negative association involved here that we're getting a respondent type of uh, conditioning happening? Or, yeah. and so, so I'll look at that. And that's often a lot of times the case with aggressive behaviors, of course. Then I might put on my operant, then I, the Skinner lens, right? And yeah. say, okay, so what are the conditions in which this behavior is happening? What are the antecedents? Uh, typically, the maintaining consequences are almost always the same, but for aggression, <laughs> uh, but the, the antecedents, of course, are going to have, there's going to be wide variety. So then I put that lens on, but then I have to, if I'm going to be a good consultant trainer, I got to make sure I put my ethology lens on and say, okay, this is either it's a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel or it's a Belgian Malinois doing, you know, what's, what's normal for that particular breed that we've selected for uh, over many generations, you know, so right. I'll put that lens on. Then you got to put your, your medical hat on, right? Because you want to make sure maybe there's something underlying medically with this dog. So that's where, it, again, it's, 
it takes time, of course, to to pull in all those sciences and get good at looking through this lens. But if you do it separately, it'll help clarify things a little bit. I think just um, at least my tiny little human brain wants to think of things that way when I'm I'm look I'm evaluating and assessing the behavior of aggression, any kind of aggressive response is to look through those different lenses to make sure I'm casting a wide net. And yeah. then if I want to treat that issue. I do the same process. I'm going to say, okay, what can I do if this is a respondent issue? If I want to change associations, if I'm on, if I'm going to work classically here, um, what can I do from that approach? If I want to work with an operant behavior, if I want to teach the dog, if I'm going to go with like a differential reinforcement procedure, am I going to apply something operant here? And then, oh, do I need to refer this dog to a vet? Because obviously, as as a non-veterinarian, I'm not doing anything medically, so that's why I work as a team with veterinarians. Yeah. But then, in the ethology lens too, I'm going to look. Okay, am I satisfying this dog's innate needs as a Belgian Malinois? Maybe there's something else going on. Is this normal behavior for the for the particular breed? You know, so is it? If, if I have a livestock guarding dog, Great Pyrenees, that's you know barking and lunging at the fence line at strangers approaching the property. I might not. I might approach that and treat that differently than if it's again a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel doing the same type of behavior. There's going to be a lot of differences there in the in the sort of treatment approach for that. So, um, yeah, I love that question because it's. I think it's important to yeah. view. You know, make sure you're looking at all the different aspects from the different sciences as much as you can, from what you know. You know, and it, 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 it just like anything else you you add more knowledge about each thing as you go along like i don't know everything about every single breed out there but as you work those cases you start to learn about okay what caucasian drivers do or you know you know different breeds that you might not see all the time uh and right. certainly medical issues that come up that you might have known about and that you spotted as something you would refer to the vet for so you know that's the that's the fun of working these cases, you know, you, you're continually learning these uh, little nuances and aspects, uh, which is which is always fun for me. And it's actually, actually especially fun now that sometimes I get referrals of, of cases, like I work with another trainer and they're getting stuck on a case and I love getting in there and really unpacking uh, things that, that are quirky or kind of strange in the norm of aggression cases. Those are fun to do for me. Yeah. Yeah, that, that you, you mentioned something that I think is real, and we didn't mention this at all. And it's especially with my, my faculty position position being in a vet school, and I like to be um, some. I think we jumped into this with the assumption that we're treating some type of, of learned or normalized normal behavioral problem. And you mentioned about any of the medical potential medical issues, or and that's one of the things that I always say from the get go. So it's I. I recognize many people here already, that was kind of a given, an assumption, but it's worth stating uh, overtly uh, here too, that the, one of the very first things we need to do with any behavioral issue is rule out the potential medical uh, mm -hmm. problems that may be involved, right? That this is not, this is not a result of some medical ailment. Uh, so uh, that's always, always, it's, it's worth throwing out that disclaimer. Yes. Yeah, especially with aggression cases, you know, yeah. there's, there's so, so many uh, underlying medical issues that are overlooked, unfortunately, um, yeah. because there's just not a, uh, the, the, the data <laughs> isn't just, there's not, it hasn't been disseminated to the masses yet in terms of what underlying medical issues or medications can be involved that can increase the likelihood of aggression. So yeah, it's always, uh, always a good idea, as you said, to, to, you know, make sure we're rolling those things out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine that's got to be in a, a particularly tough component of this as well is you know, how, where do you end up in that? So, so the, the dog's got a clean bill of health. Um, it, it is, do you, is that something that you still need to, to question at some point or, or what do you? Yeah, the analogy I use, I help clients understand is I'll, I'll say, you know, that's great. You took the dog to the veterinarian. That's great. I'm glad you did that. Thank you for doing that and being an advocate for your dog because you feel a little trust there. But then you, I add in the analogy that, okay, you've got a general, it's like you have a doctor that's a, um, a general practitioner doctor, a family medicine doctor, right? So you go there and you, you're you saying about your, you know, your heart pain. You've had heart pain like the last few days. And they say, oh, you sounds okay. You're okay. So I'm going to send you home and just keep an eye on things and call me if it gets worse, right? So, but that because that doctor's not a heart specialist, 
And so I say the same thing to clients, you may need to dig a little further and maybe get either a special influence, such as a veterinary behaviorist, or um, you know, somebody that can, can dig a little deeper into health issues or underlying health issues that can contribute to aggressive behavior. Um, and so that, that often helps clients really start to understand you know, the similarities in our field of just how many different types of trainers and veterinarians there are, and that they sometimes need to do a little sec, get a second opinion on things. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's so many components to this. It's just, this still, uh, it's still an area that absolutely, uh, it just fascinates me from so many levels, because like I said, it was one of the first things that I, I remember really fascinating me about behavior analysis and its approach to be, to behavior, this, this, um, seeing in this text where they're saying, having an entire headings talking about aggression, breeding aggression, and then going through the research that supports this idea of, hey, this is why that's happened, and going through all of the potential consequences, categorizing these things in terms of reflexive versus operant aggression, et cetera, and seeing all of that. It just, and it's still to this day, it just fascinates me because it's such. It's it's so complex as, as we've been talking about. It's so complicated. So um, that and I I've seen many people uh, talk about it. Therefore, in ways that it, to me I think can make it difficult to resolve. So that's what I find so great about your talk and and uh, your uh, uh, discussions of aggression in in general is you take such. A, a careful uh, approach to it, not assuming necessarily what's going on, but saying, "Hey, here's what we need to do, and let's let's evaluate this, and let's try to be as objective as possible." That's pretty amazing to see. So that goes a long way. I, I think. Appreciate I would, that. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine that's very helpful for the <laughs> for the uh, the clients that you're working with as well, since, as you noted, a big part of this is really working with the 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 dog owners. Uh, some of the things that they make might be triggering uh, the aggression to begin with, or or at least helping continue it. So yeah, yeah, definitely. It's um, kind of just jumping back to that too. It's it's the interesting thing about a, the topic of aggression in animals is that it's there's the language is really going to differ depending on again which science you're looking through, and that's what I found. Right. You know, even when I was doing you know, I was starting the Aggression in Dogs conference and I was doing a talk on like, what is aggression? And I started really digging deep into the academic text and the, the studies and everything. And there's just, nobody's agreeing on what aggression is. Like this is no one <laughs> right. universal definition. It's that like, there's right. so many different definitions between the ethology uh, folks and ABA. And it's just, it's interesting to me. So, um, but hopefully we're, we're continuing to tie that together, you know, and that's, yeah. that's my goal too, is to, to see this, you know, all the different sciences kind of also start to continue to add to this conversation of aggression in dogs. Yeah, it's it that's a really uh, it's a really interesting topic. That's part of what I've done with my academic career is try to bridge a lot of ethological and behavior analytic, uh, or just even general comparative psychology, even within. I mean, even within the behavioral sciences, sometimes people often forget that not all behaviorists are behavior analysts. So many behaviorists are, are, are comparative psychologists. They're, they're, they study their behavior systems people. I came from a behavior systems lab after getting a, a master's in, in behavior analysis. So I, uh, I came from a, a, a lab that did spend a lot of time bridging concepts between ethology uh, and, uh, and behavior analytic, and then behaviorist traditional comparative psychology approaches to behavior. So uh, that's a very, that in and of itself is very difficult, which is part of why I mentioned um, some of the, the different components there, because um, I think it's very easy for people to get lost in just the operant aggression component of it and forget some of the aspects of this in terms of how is this just being, how do we have aggression that's being elicited? And is there stimulus stimulus pairings that continue to produce the aggression that are uh, insensitive at some level to uh, operant consequences, since that can occur too. So you can, you can auto shape aggression at some level. That's just a wild concept in and of itself that you can actually get aggression that is resistant to consequence changes so that it doesn't, 
it's it's resistant to operant uh, conditioning at that level. And I think that is easy for people to, to, to say, wait a second, no, 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 but all behavior is affected by its consequences. Yes and no, it's not as simple as that. We can, we can continue to produce uh, behavior that is more sensitive to its eliciting events than it is the consequating events. So yes. I would imagine you deal with that. Uh, you get to see some Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to unpack what you just said in my mind a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> So let me let me see if I can think. Of I told one. you I'm a little rusty on my ABA. <laughs> yeah, no, no worry. I, I'm trying to think of, of an example that I, I can think of non-aggression yeah. examples that are that are um, uh, pretty easy because I I, I talk about um, some of this. Uh, you know, respondent and operant conditioning are almost always occurring simultaneously. So there's not this easy distinction between the two. So the easiest yeah. way to distinguish is procedurally. But there are important components, even just in describing them procedurally, where you have respondent behavior that will over and, and vice versa, by the way, I should be clear about this respondent behavior that overrides. So respondently conditioned behavior. Let me be clear about that. Um, so the respondent conditioning will override any operant conditioning procedures. And you, you can have the other effect as well. So with respect to the former, one of the uh, one of the most common examples is what's called auto shaping. Um, and that's so the, this was Brown and Jenkins, 68, um, Williams and Williams, 69. These are throwing out some random research studies on this topic. Um, but the, the simple idea was that they would get uh, so it's 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 eliciting. It's using stimuli to elicit voluntary behavior. That's the idea that uh, most people are, or we've, the traditional way of being trained, but the distinction between respondent and operant is that, oh, respondent is involuntary and op operant is voluntary, right? So Pavlov's dog salivating in the presence of meat powder or, or the, the tone, the metronome, the tone of the metronome, either that those are involuntary. The dog doesn't have the choice. If we're talking about eye blinking or something like that, the puff of air, and then it's, it, it elicits this eye blink that is involuntary. But you can produce plenty of voluntary behavior through respondent conditioning. So this is why I was trying to think of an aggression example that works with this. Um, we actually use an auto shaping procedure with a, a penguin enrichment training uh, device. A penguin in, we train penguins to interact with an enrichment device. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm bringing up penguins now again. Um, so uh, primarily rock hoppers. That all we did was we paired uh, the enrichment device with food. So no different than if we're talking about responding conditioning, pairing the click with food, right? How you're producing that conditioned reinforcer. So every time I'm sitting there, you know, this is this is what this is the neutral stimulus or supposedly neutral that we're producing into a conditioned or conditional stimulus. So, CS food US CS US CS US, and that's that that's the respondent pairing. And then this can then function uh, potentially, although we could get into that um, uh, as a, a conditioned reinforcer uh, for some other response. So now there's that that mm -hmm. flow between respondent and operant. But uh, so one of the things you can actually do is just the pairing of those two stimuli. In this case, we presented enrichment devices and then threw food around the enrichment devices and the penguins started contacting the enrichment devices, going after them because this was, this was part of their natural foraging response. That's in essence what you're doing is you're eliciting a natural foraging response to this. So if I were trying to think of an example like that with aggression, it would be events that are paired. So if we have something like if a dog's natural response is to mm -hmm. uh, a bite another, say like, let's say at some level, uh, and by the way, we could, we could debate what I mean by natural in this case, but let's say at some level, the dog's natural response is to bite a dog that bites it or something like that. So that's part of the response to an aversive stimulus is you bite back, you bite the thing that bites you. Um, 
So if I start pairing something with that, uh, that you know, the, the biting, the other dog biting, so it's now you see the presence of, uh, of this other, uh, just a, a, I don't know, the, the person who used, that was walking the dog that would go to bite this dog. That now the, that the person itself can function as an eliciting, a conditioned stimulus that potentially elicits that response. Yes. And that's different than saying that it, that person set, it functions just, it, it can have dual functions. It can have discriminative stimuli, so it can set the occasion for the operant behavior. But that distinction is important in and of itself, of knowing that, hey, wait a second, how do we deal with the fact that this is being elicited, not that it's just being consecrated? Let me let me throw an example at you then. I yeah. think I, I think I have the concept down, but I think and, and this is what I'm. I'll use an example of that I'm sure many of the trainers can um, uh, have been in the same situation. So you get to a client's home. The, the issue is the dog uh, is aggressive towards people that come to the home. So you go to the yeah. yard. The dog's behind a fenced in yard. So you're safe, protected contact, mm -hmm. and you're tossing treats to the dog. Dog's barking and lunging at you. Yeah, through the fence. You're tossing treats. You're tossing treats. So your goal there, of course, is is on the respondent side to change that association, change that emotional response of I'm not going to, you know, the behavior is is motivated because of, let's say it's a fear-based issue, though it's fearful of, of strangers. And the you, after a while of doing that, you start to see the behavior shift to, you know, more affiliative behavior. Let's call it uh, just looking, maybe sniffing the air, trying to get more information about the person, uh, because the motivation has shifted from I'm not so afraid of this person. This guy coming onto the property, he's throwing hot dogs at me. Okay, it's, it's actually good. So look at that respondent side. But then at the same time, we can start to, uh, you know, if you rinse and repeat that process, you've got the stranger coming onto the property as the environmental cue to look back, it, uh, this is, I'm skipping a step here. So let's say the owner starts to pair the treats with the arrival of the stranger. So no contingency on behavior, just right. somebody showing up, you see that person and that predicts treats for you. So we're still getting the respondent side here, but then if they start to time it well, and every time the dog notices this new stranger coming on the property, that person becomes the environmental cue to look back at the handler, the owner for treats because so I think I'm on the same line of thinking there uh, in terms of what you were just talking about, where, where our goal is kind of twofold. We've got an operant behavior that we can get, but we're also working on the respondent side of changing that underlying emotional response. Is that yeah, yeah, that gets at, so the, the part of the reason why, and by the way, this is, I think this is about the, the this is the third third time in, in some of these virtual second or third time in one of the in in the virtual virtual behavior chat um that i've talked about auto shaping at some level um because i think it's important for um many operant people to uh or, or people that are used to dealing with consequences and thinking about just consecrating behavior to recognize these things um in this sense so when you look at the way that auto shaping was traditionally done um, even if you change the consequences, so this is part of what Williams and Williams looked at, um, even if you change the consequences, if you still have the elicited, the, the, the stimulus-stimulus pairings occurring, you're not going to stop the behavior from occurring. So uh, in their example, Williams, they're do dealing with pigeons and key pecking. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. as long as the food continues to be uh, paired with the key pecking, it doesn't matter if you're trying to punish this response. And so that's where I'm, uh, from, from that perspective, mm -hmm. we could sit there and say, let me focus on some operant contingencies involved here. And all I need to do is change the consequences that are involved. Um, so uh, I'll give you a tip. Often many of these examples involve people trying to be punishing at some level. So, um, you know, the, the mailman shows up, the dog starts barking. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, and now the doorbells being paired with the mailman or, or people showing up to the door or something like that. It's funny. This is actually something. Um, when, well, I should say this is related to some of the stuff that Sophia uh, Yin and I did with with developing the treat and train. And, and the study we published on this uh, was dealing with all the people showing up at the door. But I'm using this in a different example of showing where the operant contingencies might not be affected is as long as that that pairing is still consistent 
where um, the person, is, so you have this condition stimulus now that's been paired with the person showing up um, and the, the doorbell ringing or the knock at the door and the person is uh, uh, attempting to consecrate that response in some other way, it may be not as effective until they disrupt the eliciting uh, stimuli. And I could, I would imagine that's really relevant for aggression cases because we have you, you have somebody that might try to intervene at some, especially with punishers, which mystifies me beyond belief is that people think, hey, let me throw on another stimulus that could potentially elicit more aggression. And I'm going to try to use that to consequate, you know, to punish the response. That way, so that's, I, that's the part I, uh, I guess I, I'm interested in, in terms of aggression. Um, I was looking at Rebecca's example here too. Um, so the instinctively barks at, at startling stimuli. Uh, yeah, um, so part, yeah, Rebecca, part of what you're getting at here, um, right, that there's still that the the contingency between the eliciting stimuli, right? So the pre we haven't done anything to disrupt the eliciting stimulus or or the, the conditions. Part of how that's often done um, is that we say let's arrange the environment in some way. Let's change the environment. So let's not allow the environment to have those that contingency in play, the respondent contingency in play, and then we can. But sometimes I think that's the easy way to think about, well, that's how we're going to make the operant contingencies, contingencies effective. But from, from a, a scientific perspective, it's, yeah, but the respondent conditioning was still so important for the display of aggression, right? So uh, anyway, boy, we're, we're heading down some uh, aggression. Yeah, rabbit I love down. it. <laughs> <laughs> and to add, add to the conversation too, is that when we're seeing those kind of problems arise, we, we, uh, we're getting stuck or like in the doorbell case you were mentioning too, is that, you know, safety is, as if we're talking about motivating operations, I mean, safety is going to override any kind of, you know, uh, attempt at learning for the animal. So that's got to come first for the, for the right. dog. And, feel, and feeling safe in that environment or else you're not going to see much behavior change for some dogs. So yeah, lots of, lots of rabbit holes we can go down for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, that's such an important and relevant point too. I, I have the luxury often in, in uh, situations that I'm in since I, you know, I primarily work in, in zoo environments. Um, and when I do work with companion animals, it's typically uh, from a research perspective. Right. So um, it's been a long time since I've done uh, much direct training consulting at any level. Um, so uh, I have the luxury in most zoo environments in that I'm safe automatic, almost all automatically. Let's hope I'm safe at any level. <laughs> the animal yeah. can the animal should not be able to reach me. So even if there is an aggressive display at some level, even if there is um, and I, I uh, I can't think of any project that we've ever worked on in a zoo where we've dealt, where we were, we've measured aggression, but we haven't directly, I, I, there's no project I, I can think of that where we've tried to directly intervene on aggression because so much of it is, is about arranging that environment. Yeah. It's, it's well live. thought out ahead of time <laughs> Right. versus the, uh, the pet parents home in a lot of cases. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think yeah. that's that's a big difference in and of itself. So that's a really relevant point to, to bring up about how uh, wh what are the conditions of the environment for the safety? A lot <laughs> of differences. Yeah, and if that's what you know, it makes me laugh sometimes too. Is you hear in like some of the forums, they start, you know, some of the trainers, just, you know, they start talking about tools and stuff, and um, you know, you can they start talking about training like other species and animals to do certain things through you know positive reinforcement uh approaches and then um there's always the arguments well you know you're not living with a killer whale in your house you know and so it's like a different you know they're comparing apples and oranges it's just always fun for me to watch those conversations unfold when somebody's like no you can totally use this kind of collar on the dog yeah it's just it, it, <laughs> well anyway it, I, there, there's been interest you know um i, I I've done some elephant research and I've spent some time around elephant trainers and 
uh, elephant keepers and well that I don't know that there is such a thing as an elephant keeper that's not also an elephant trainer so um, uh, and there there's some interesting history there itself um, there was a, a, a I knew a vet that worked in uh, areas of Sumatra that worked with some of the logging camps uh, with Asian elephants and so I've seen um, some of the effects of, and, and this is going to be important, I think, for aggression and talking about this, some of the tra training tools that Mahouts use with the elephants. Uh, so in talking about transferring similar training tools, these things exist across different species, right? So, uh, and I will say, if you want to see what a pinch collar looks like for an elephant, it is really, it, it, it shows you a, a whole new level of ugly. Um, it is not. Uh, I've seen injuries, for instance, that that uh, vets have gone in and treated for uh, mm. these collars that they put there. Almost, it's a horseshoe like collar that they'll put on an elephant where it's spikes, you know, uh, mm. 10, 12 inch spikes that, are, that, that dig into the very thick skin of an elephant. And the, they're injuring the elephant because the mahouts are riding them using their feet to prod these in. Uh, by the way, uh, for anybody who's, and everybody should be cringing at some level um, about hearing about this, but I don't, that's not that far off from some modern equestrian uh, training procedures as well. Um, so I, I, part of why I'm bringing this up is because one of the areas that I found incredibly fascinating or, or and disturbing, equally disturbing, but fascinating from um, the, you know, my inquisitive perspective is, and we already alluded to this, is when people will look at aggression cases, look at a dog displaying aggression and say, well, my response is I need to, to deliver a shock or a choke mm -hmm. or, or it's something along the, I, it, it blows my mind to see that that's the response um, that people, I actually, I'll, I'll leave the store. I have an, uh, an inch, I worked with a Doberman, Doberman rescue in Texas when I was a graduate student there and I had, I'll leave the experience out there, but it, it, just saying that I worked with a Doberman uh, rescue in Texas probably says a lot in and of itself. Um, but there, there was a, a trainer who was actually yelling in German at the dogs and dealing with, and he was their aggression expert. Um, so I got to see some interesting uh, elicited aggression out of the dogs in response to a dog being, you know, alpha rolled while being yelled, yelled at, you know, nine screamed at and, and alpha rolled and, and then dogs trying to bite back. So um, I, 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 that's, I'm, I'm leading into a kind of a question here, which is a <laughs> very roundabout way, which is how common is, is that that you're dealing with, with people still looking for somehow punishing some component or, or using aversive stimuli mm -hmm. in general to deal with aggression? All the time, yeah. <laughs> so, Renee just finished every day. Yeah. yeah Kathy every, too, all the time. Everyone's unfortunately, was... yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's unfortunate. I will say though, thanks to, um, you know, the way information is spread much more quickly these days, uh, is that the positive training is getting more into the mainstream, thankfully. So oh, yeah. I, I would say in my observations over, um, you know, I've, I've 17 years of training, about 10 years of exclusively taking aggression cases, is I do see some really positive changes happening in the pet community. So the pet owner community. So like trainers like us, we, we've had this conversation a million times about what we need to do. But pet owners don't necessarily get exposed to that, but I'm seeing some really positive uh, changes in that regard to seeing positive training uh, being applied to aggression cases by the pet owners seeking out this information. So I get to a client's uh, sometime and they, they've they already done their research and I'm like, okay, so what have you what have you researched? And then they, they start to, well, you know, I found, um, you know, Leslie McDevitt and I'm like, great. And there's this great blog by Patricia, Patricia McConnell. I mean, she's, she's good. Right. I'm like, yes. And, uh, and, uh, you know, people like Renee Erdman with her Instagram channel, you know, like there's so many good, so yeah. many good things happening out there. And that just is getting spread out to the masses, which is great. Um, that being said, yeah, yes, there's sometimes people that are doing things that, but again, it's we have to be empathetic because they're doing a lot of clients they're just doing the best they can with the information they have 
So the punishment is what they think works. That's what gets pushed out on TV and TV shows and things like that. So it's, we're, it's like a battle of information and right. it can be so conflicting. And, and uh, but once they, once you start getting into the conversation of the underlying motivations for their dog's behavior, it helps them to think a little bit more about, um, you know, why their dog is doing what they're doing and where punishment really would be counterintuitive. So if you're talking about, you know, certainly the big three that we always hear about fear, anxiety, and stress, and how when you start using human examples of what punishment can do to somebody that's in fear or is anxious or stressed, um, or some of the other things, or is in pain or is frustrated, you know, we could talk about, we could go down this rabbit hole next about the underlying uh, reasons, whether they be emotions or motivating operations or, you know, all these other things that can happen underneath the hood, so to speak, that helps the clients understand, I think, empathize a little more with their dogs. So I always, I pull a lot of human analogies out. I, I anthropomorphize like so much, but it's because I want the clients to really understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I talk to them about their, how they're feeling, so they're, you know, when they feel stressed or frustrated. And then I say, well, your dog might be feeling the same way. So it's probably something we want to avoid trying to or accidentally making that worse by using this particular type of tool or this method and that can often help with the paradigm shift we need to to steer them right back into the, the direction we want them to go to so yeah it's uh it's it's slow and steady but um you know it's uh, i i do see a positive change in the overall pet owning uh you know market but also um i think it's cultural too and i think that's really important to understand is culture the culture of, you know, whether it's a, whether it's the microcosm you're in or on in a different country, you're working, you know, if you've got a client in a different country, the culture of dogs is going to be so much different in their own unique experiences and what they think is going to work for changing behavior and for training and for lifestyle and for everything you look at in the dogs, in the dogs, uh, the dogs culture, how that society or that particular culture treats their dogs it happens in the, the macro scale where the country they live in and then it happens in the micro scale and that individual's own experiences with what they know about dog training and dog behavior. Um, and so important to remember that. And it's and, and important to remember that with trainer, other trainers in our industry, you know, they're a lot of them, they don't, they're, they're just a product of the culture and what they've been exposed to and what they've found to learn from. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's important to remember that and um, empathize with, with our, fellow trainers as well, I think. Yeah, I, I was going to say there was a, a wonderful paper that I read uh, not long ago um, uh, by a uh, uh, academician, uh, Gabrielson, uh, 2017. I'll throw out any, I'll, I'll put this when we upload the, the, when I upload the YouTube video, I'll put any references that I'm mentioning here um, up as well. But this was uh, someone involved in the dog training uh, community in Norway. Uh, and they wrote a, a wonderful paper uh, looking at uh, some of the transitions from traditional training uh, techniques to uh, clicker training procedures and talking about uh, some of that transition through listservs and whatnot in Norway. So uh, it's a really interesting historical perspective and then just talking about, and one of the funny things, and it, this is, uh, uh, one of the interesting t parts here too, especially we've got, uh, uh, she, uh, so the Gabrielson, she talks about, um, a large, uh, where gender is associated, uh, with, and I, I mentioned this because here we've got, you know, Michael and I, two guys sitting here talking uh, about, uh, aggression and aggression problems with dogs, um, which, uh, one of the things Gabrielson notes from a qualitative approach is, how much uh, 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 there's been that the field in general of almost all applied, but she's specifically talking about dog training, almost all applied animal behavior issues have uh, that, that the ratio is much higher for women, but then from a traditional training perspective, you see, or balance training or, or whatever we're going to call it these days, that there, that ends up being the ratio starts to sway back towards men. So uh, the, the the, the, the simple, uh, the, the synopsis of what I just said is men are more likely to be jerk trainers. Uh, that's really the, the thumb down. <laughs> I think it's okay for us to talk about that because I, you know, I agree with that, st that statement, you know, it's certainly been my observation. Uh, and yeah. that's, 
uh, that not just in the US, but you know, Norway, we just, I have a client in Norway and we were actually, we actually had a very similar conversation regarding that and that the approaches to training, um, you know, and, and the access really to the information is for positive training is more narrow there, of course, but yeah, um, yeah definitely some cultural differences. Yeah, uh, it, it's really, it was interesting to read that, you know, a peer reviewed paper that details some of the potential causes mm -hmm. and, and, and variables related to these differences. Um, she's taking a, a qualitative approach to this and, and, and describing uh, some of the potential factors involved, but it's, it's very interesting um, to see this described. I had not seen any other <laughs> academic paper attempt to approach this topic um, that I find really fascinating in and of itself. Um, again, uh, uh, just the, the issue of treating uh, not just aggression, but any, any behavioral issues with, uh, with punishment, um, with aversive uh, predominantly aversive conditioning techniques, um, which seems problematic. So I can only imagine how, 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 how well, anyway, if, if you need a good reference for um, uh, something along those lines, uh, I, I'll, again, I'll throw the reference up there when I upload the video about uh, Gabrielson 2017. Um, I don't remember the title of the paper, but it'll be up there. So yeah, we still have people showing up here too. Um, yeah. <laughs> sometimes we get some uh, latecomers showing up, and uh, I mean, every there's going to be the video up for everyone to be able to see too. Um, you you had noted you had you had talked a little bit. I mean, we've talked about behaviors, we've talked about um, eliciting events, eliciting stimuli, and some of these differences between uh, scientific approaches. You were. I know you wanted to talk a bit about some of the motivating factors. Uh, we can talk about the, if we're using the behavior ease, we can talk about motivating operations or establishing operations uh, and abolishing operations or setting events. Setting events tends to be my preferred term generally, even though it can mean slightly different things, but I'm, again, I'm being more, I'm being more overly academic right now. Um, so you were interested in some of the, in talking about some of the motivating factors involved. Yeah, yeah, I, I know we touched upon them, but I'd, I'd actually love to get your point of view too, because you know, I uh, there's, there's lots of schools of thought on what what are emotional responses and um, what are the setting events that can be part of behavior uh, when you're looking at what's going on again in the brain and, and underneath the hood rather than in the environment. And um, so, the, typically, people ask, like, what what is motivating dogs to be, be aggressive? That's a very common question I get and sometimes you know if somebody asks you that in a news interview and you gotta unpack that in like 30 seconds. But I go <laughs> back to that. I, I I remind, you know, I use words that or at least the the terminology that most people understand and, and that I'm so glad that the fear free movement has really uh, um, focused on fear, anxiety and stress. So the FAS, those are three very yeah. common the common acronym which I love that it's getting out there because it's it is one of the those are the three really major ones in, in aggression cases so fear obviously mm -hmm. not all aggression is fear-based so i want to make sure we clarify that that misnomer <laughs> sure. was going around for a while and it just was it was driving me nuts but um <laughs> but it's a certainly common one fear is very common in aggression cases anxiety or sort of the unknown of what can happen especially when we start mixing punishers and uh, reinforcers in our in our approach um i see that the, the anxiety component there really having a, a role uh stress you know stressors throughout the day stress stress stacking uh, i like to call it more stress soup but yes adding stressors throughout the dog's day are common but then the ones i'd like to see continue to enter the conversation are things like arousal and we could spend right. all day defining that as well because that's a very a hot topic in the uh dog training world anyways, but arousal is something that, you know, it does exist and we can def define that many ways, but something I look at with the aggression cases is that over arousal starts to affect cognitive functioning in a sense, and that it's gonna impact decision, good decisions in a way, and that's, you can sometimes see aggression spill into that picture, aggressive behaviors. Yeah. Uh, frustration, so the, uh, inability to accomplish a task, which we see all the time in our dogs that have issues on leash or our leash reactive dogs, um, dogs that are behind barriers and things like that. 
Uh, so uh, anger, another one. When will we see the dogs? You know, and this this that's another hot topic, right? We can talk about like what does angry look like, but right. The common one is um, you know, you grab a bone out of a dog's mouth, you know, and you look at the body language of a lot of people say, oh, he's just fearful of losing the resource, and there might be some truth to that in some context, I think, but. The dog usually looks pretty pissed off. You just did that, you know. And that's if I'm gonna if I'm gonna operationalize and, and show what, what uh, anger looks like in a dog, I'm gonna grab a video of that, like showing somebody swiping or, or doing something really annoying to their dog, like on TikTok, you know, some of the silly TikTok challenges. Somebody like tapping on the dog's head to see what they would do, and then the dog finally bites them with a nice hard stare, you know. So right. that's, that's anger. Uh, so that's another one to kind of unpack. And then there's pain, uh, of course. So that's a little bit of a different type of uh, setting event um, or yeah. motivation rather. And then um, and then the ones that are the dogs that are doing it for fun. So the emotion of happiness, and if we could really get into that uh, in terms of aggressive behavior. But what, what else would you, would you add anything to that list in terms of uh, motivations in your, in just aggression in general in animals? Well, I, I can talk a little bit about some of the um, being uh, some of the descriptors, some of the, the, the constructs itself and the use of those. Um, and I, ha I think I have a slightly different, interesting perspective on that. Um, but I'll, I'll come back around to that. So if I forget, because I'm I, I don't mean there's a, a lot to talk about. <laughs> I, I also I don't mean to live up to the stereotype, but I can be a bit of an absent minded scientist. So if I <laughs> you can prompt me and I'll be like, oh, that's right. Um, I, I also love tangents, so never let. Um, uh, so, but that said, I, I was going to ask, and I don't know to what extent. Um, again, as somebody who doesn't, and I've been trying to make this clear throughout all of this, as somebody who doesn't study aggression, doesn't necessarily work with aggression, um, you know, if something is aggressive towards me, my usual response is just get out of the way um, because I don't have to deal with the aggression um, at some level, you know. When I've had an elephant or, or a gorilla uh, be aggressive towards me, um, I say, well, you can't get to me, so I guess that's the end of that. Um, I'm in protected contact with that animal. Um, so, but nonetheless, um, I've certainly dealt, and I, you know, I have a, a paper out about dealing with fearful sheep, for instance, um, and, and working with that. Um, one of the things that I, so that was all to say, I don't work directly with aggression. I want to be clear. I didn't know to what extent there can be displaced aggression, displacement from the ethological uh, concept in this case. And for anybody that's not uh, entirely familiar with displace, displacement from an ethological perspective, what you'll you'll see this in like territoriality, um, some stuff like that. So nest building and stickleback fish. There's a common example for displacement. Is you know one builds a, a nest over here, the other builds a nest. They have overlapping territory. They keep one comes over here to get that one out of the territory. So here, let's use the penguin examples again, <laughs> right? So this one swims into this guy's territory to get him out of there. The other then swims back. So they keep entering each other's territories basically chasing each other like this. And then eventually, since that's a never ending loop, one of them engages in what they, what ethologists refer to displacement. So it just goes over and starts nest building. And then the other one swims away. Um, and so that's the displaced behavior is the nest building behavior. That's what it different than the Freudian concept of displacement. Let's be clear. So um, I don't know that animals engage in Freudian displacement, but they certainly <laughs> engage in ethological displacement. Um, so I don't know if you see that some in uh, aggression that's, uh, I know from, from a behavior analytic perspective, the way that I wanna look at um, uh, aggression, I wanna classify it in, in functions based on those, the, the consequences and those contingencies, right? So I wanna look at um, a lot of it, a lot of operant aggression obviously is explained in terms of uh, escape maintained aggression mm -hmm. right that's that's a prime like what we talked about earlier that's a primary function is it turns off the aversive stimulus of the presence of this other organism and it ties into some of the ethological functions some of the species specific functions for that to work that way as well um so uh, i just saw sonia's comment there about the penguins um but uh 
so displacement was the one that I, I just thought. Um, but then other than that, thinking about potential operant functions. So you mentioned some of the happiness component, which I might say might be, um, that could be if, if I were talking about how do we describe that from a behavioral perspective, um, is that potentially uh, attention maintained aggression or uh, even, I'm not a big fan of the term uh, uh, automatic reinforcement in general, um, because I don't, it's a bit of a circular argument, but nonetheless, is it, are we talking about something that produces um, species typical uh, uh, sequences of behavior? So something related like that. That's yeah. Good. So a, a big part of what I would be looking at identifying is things from that operant. So if we're talking about operant aggression is the escape maintained versus attention maintained. And then stuff that is not operant in terms of, well, but this is elicited and then it's maintained by respondent conditioning procedures as we talked about with auto shaping or it's, it's maintained by uh, species typical uh, 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 sequences in some sense. So we can talk about that as a modal action at modal action pattern at some mm -hmm. level. We could talk about, is it displaced? So here this, the, the you know, there, there's two behaviors that are not resolving each other and the animal, much like the stickleback fish that nest builds all of a sudden, you know, there are two animals are basically growling back and forth, growling back and forth and then bite. And, and that bite just displaced uh, uh, that the, the growling behavior at some level. And, and there's of course gonna be the combinations of those. So um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a lot of yeah, for the displaced part of the conversation, you know, I, I think the one common phrase is in the dog trainer is redirected aggression, and right. it's the the fuel there is the frustration component. The dog cannot complete its certain task, or you know, kind of the simple definition of frustration, and we're not able to accomplish the the behavior you're trying to complete. So you displaced your uh, your frustration on something close by and so the dog's right. the dog's intended target wasn't necessarily your leg when it's barking and lunging at another dog but it needs to displace that somewhere and your leg is the perfect place to do that in some some cases so uh, i do think that exists but here's like to broaden the conversation back to the to the um to the dogs doing it for fun and in a sense much more operantly i guess if you want to call it Right. Um, I think dogs are one of the species on the planet that humans have done enough tinkering with to, you know, we've selected for for a lot of these aggressive behaviors in some of the breeds, right? So we've selected sure. for, um, let's say, bull, bull baiting dogs. So the dogs, like, we want you to hang off a dog's nose, our bull's nose for sport, right? And um, Mastiff, we, you know. we might argue, yeah, we might argue that that's the, what's happening inside the brain is much different. So it's a different chemical response that's happening, um, uh, much like the dog's engaged in an activity that they're having a good time doing versus a, an escape avoidance situation, which most of aggressive behaviors are uh, to, to increase distance from a particular threatening stimulus. It's that's one side of aggression, but we, it's interesting to me. And what's really fascinating to me is when we start to see maladaptive aspects of this so when i was just actually uh talking with jennifer uh Shryock, she runs um family mm -hmm. pause which she focuses on yeah. uh, child safety but also uh, she deals a lot with you know fatalities and dog to child type of situations very sad uh cases but we're talking about some of these really um uh rare cases in which it's very difficult to unpack what's happening for sure with the motivation for that dog so the dog hears the baby crying and there's vocalization involved but then you know the, uh, something tragic happens in those cases so um what's the motivation there you know some yeah. there's a lot of unpacking to do there because we don't know for sure but that brings the question is was that dog doing something that we've selected for and it's become maladaptive and now they're um expressing those genes in a different way it's just, you know, it brings out a fascinating conversation because what a lot of times we're just thinking, oh, it's the dog was afraid of the, the baby or which is which is a lot of the times the case. Most of the time right. the case, the dog is anxious or stressed or afraid of the, the baby. But sometimes it's not that. 
And so those are the type of aggressive behaviors we see that are, uh, you know, really interesting to me to like look at the underlying motivations, what's going on in that dog's brain, uh, both, both, you know, from a cognitive standpoint, but from the neurochemical aspect, you know, it's, it's different. So I don't know. That's my two cents on this conversation there. <laughs> it, this is, it's one of these things where at the end of the day, and, and it's funny because I see, so I, 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 I ended up, I end up starting these sentences where I go, and I'm already three steps ahead in my own, in my mind in the sentence. So, so I have to stop and go, yeah. let me make each one of those points first before I continue to, um, but uh, so backing up from the sentence I was about to jump into, um, uh, I, uh, uh, Mara Valles um, had me evaluate some, um, some papers for her uh, sh uh, shelter playgroup alliance. Uh, conference. So we went through um, and then her and I sat down and talked about some of these papers that are all related to sheltered uh, animals, sheltered dogs um, specifically. And of course, a lot of the papers dealt with aggression. So there were papers like Dinwoody et al. Uh, 2019 that looked at some of the comorbidity uh, with things like aggression. Uh, which was really interesting to see, um, especially where they talked about stuff related to separation anxiety, what I would call separation related behaviors. Um, that, it, it, so it was fascinating to see where people were finding components of aggression. The one thing I can tell you that seems to be pretty clear in a lot of cases for aggression is it is nowhere near as static or easily testable as people would have you uh, want, want, right? So going into a shelter and trying to develop some type of test to determine how aggressive some dog is, it seems like it's a near impossible task and should be because behavior is always contextual, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, trying to say, well, this dog is just an aggressive dog. I want to stop and go, wait a second. No, the dog isn't aggressive. The conditions under which yes. these, these events occurred and these, these stimuli and consequences, all of this produced aggression under that circumstance. So that's really relevant. I mean, we can say individuals and even species are at some level that there is a higher probability of seeing aggression right but i that's the part that i i'm hesitant about when i see you know the creation of any uh topographical label or construct or something like that that's where i end up and that's what skinner spent a lot of time talking against these kind of ideas too of turning the aggression into anger and then putting it inside the organism so but otherwise i see the utility i understand the utility of it i'm just cautious I'm skeptical, like a good science. And I'm glad you are. <laughs> and I'm so glad you said that too. And you mentioned the shelter aspects as well. It's just their behavior snapshots, you know, it's not, Yeah. and it's it's certainly not fair to to decide an animal's fate based on one behavior snapshot. Um, yeah. Sans some rare exceptions, you know, somebody's getting killed by a dog, you know, but it's most of the time, it's, you're just catching a behavior snapshot. Imagine judging somebody, uh, their fate on their drive home after getting cut off by several people and somebody flipped them the bird and, you know, and then we're judging their entire behavior patterns on that one moment, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing that can happen with dogs. We have to look at the whole, you know, look at much more than just one moment in time. So, you know, the, yeah, you could go off in a whole tangent on the shelter assessments and, and what, um, what works well in certain uh, contexts, but it's, it's, always better and i do the same with my cases it's better to just get a whole picture like get a get a good idea based on historical data and all the interviewing process with the client and whoever else has been involved in the dog that's going to give you a much more robust picture of what that dog's behavior could potentially be like in certain contexts right yep um i i've been uh i i've been reading through um uh, so Stephanie Edlin's a good friend of mine, and I've been reading, she's been working on her thesis on animal communication and body language. And so this has been a big part of, of what she's talked about in her thesis is um, just looking at the, how 
these behaviors need to be contextualized as all behavior. That's something that I express all the time. All behavior needs to be contextualized. We cannot turn it into that one thing, that one uh, label, construct, whatever we want to call it. Um, you can't just look at that like what you said, the snapshot. Mm -hmm. We cannot just take that one snapshot and say, that's it. Now I know. E even just identifying whether something is in fact meeting the definition of what we're calling aggression and trying to determine it from that one snapshot. Mm -hmm. um, so her, you know, I think you would have a, a, a fun time talking to her about this issue as well, um, about contextualizing aggression, but there's something that I've brought up to her, I've talked to her about a bunch of times in relation to this, is that the answers we get also very much change based on the types of questions we ask. So this has yes. always been something that, and this is, I think, really relevant for aggression. Well, all of behavior, it's relevant for all behavior, but this is one of the things that's really fascinated me about sometimes seeing these arguments of, from ethologists versus psychologists, or, you know, I'm, uh, you see this in animal behavior that has so much influence from, from both uh, psychologists and biologists at the same time, right? So the comparative psychologists, the behaviorists, and the ethologists. And so you'll see some of these disputes. And a lot of time the disputes are, you know, you, you're asking different questions. So one of you is on this spectrum of Tinbergen's four, four questions, and the other is on this spectrum. So uh, you're asking about ultimate functions, and this other person's asking about prox proximate mechanisms. So we're talking about adapt. One person's arguing for the adaptive value component yeah. of this, and the other one's talking about the learning. And it's like you, you know these these are not. It, it happens yeah. to deal with the way you've asked the question that produces this the different type of answers you get. This is otherwise um, a bit of a convoluted argument to try to say no 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 but this is more important from an adaptive value perspective. Well, that's one component of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it just, it just jumping back into the context conversation too, you know, a, a really helpful tip for trainers and consultants when they're doing the interview process with clients is um, if the client's telling you something about the dog's uh, bite incident or that particular situation, try to profile profile a little bit. So go back to previous cases in which the similar contexts are starting to appear. So let's use an example. Dog um, growled and snapped at the owner when they went to sit down on the couch next to the dog. All right, and so immediately we're profiling. We, uh, trainers that are experienced with this type of issue are gonna start profiling. Okay, it could be the dog guarding the couch. But go back and just think about previous cases where you've had a dog on the couch and, and you can start asking questions about similar situations, similar contexts. So then that allows you to make sure you're covering all the bases and hitting all those check marks and ensuring that you are assessing the behavior correctly or properly so you can give the right uh, behavior plan. So you might ask, you know, was there, does your dog guard any other resources or does your dog, uh, has your dog been, um, does the dog do it when you're petting the dog or have you tried to move the dog off the couch? Um, and you start to uh, really start to unravel because sometimes you don't have a lot of data because you know, most clients aren't coming up with you with 30 or 40 bites with a rich history of data, keeping track of everything that happened. You've got to go and you might have one incident, one bite incident. And so you've got to do a good job profiling and, and uh, asking the right questions. That way, in that one incident, you're going to determine what the antecedent was, hopefully, and what the motivating operations were and all those things that, that really you might only have one incident, but because you've experienced this same type of incident in many other cases, you can start to um, ask those questions, you know. So that's that's what I find really helpful. If I'm getting stuck or I don't know, go back to your old cases. Think about similar contexts because it's it's contextual. And guess what? Once you start getting all the context, you start to see the same things over and over and over and over. And, and, and yeah, sometimes you just have to ask one question and you're like, oh, okay. Know what's happening here so uh which which well, clients it brings them such peace of mind when they know why their dog is doing what they're doing and you explain to them um why what's happening and explain the conditions and then uh then you have a treatment plan usually once you understand those conditions so uh, very helpful i've found to do uh yeah. that that sort of communication and questioning yeah 
Yeah, and it's interesting that you brought up too about the importance of when you mentioned hopefully that you're assessing the situation because that that seems to be a reoccurring theme that's extremely important too is that often what you're dealing with is how much do you know what you do know about what's going on, right? So how much can you, um, and I think that's going back to the beginning of what we talked about, this assumption um, that, that it's very easy for people to get um, uh, bought into some of the, the emotionality of the, this, mm -hmm. this discussion of in, they're invested in this particular perspective. So there's often a lot of, no, 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 this is what's happening. Yeah. This is what's happening. And we have to be cautious with some of those assumptions. Yeah. Uh, it, and I will, I do want to add to this is that, you know, maybe some of the trainers that are listening in are probably like, ooh, maybe I uh, missed something in that case or I didn't assess it properly. But the nice thing about is often the treatment plan underlying motivation and the um, uh, what's happening in, the, in that context your treatment plan is going to be very similar. So it's kind of hard to screw things up, especially if you're using, you know, a good positive reinforcement paradigm on that, on that particular issue, you're going to get the classical conditioning most of the time coming along for the ride. It's, it's really kind of hard to screw things up when the, when it's an aggressive behavior, because you, you know, there's, there's less risk of inadvertently reinforcing undesirable behaviors than if it was something else. Like if I'm not assessing like, or not doing the right treatment plan for like jumping up on the counter, you know, to, to grab and I'm like, all right, we're just gonna right. do whatever, whatever procedure that those things you can screw up, but, but with aggression, usually you're, you're okay. You know, so if the dog is guarding the couch and when it was actually a bone hiding under that couch, but we're still approaching the couch with, you know, trying to change the association of people approaching the couch, you're still going to get away with it. <laughs> you know, like, okay, though they're coming near me because I've got the bone and I'm, I'm getting higher value treats and I've got the bone that I'm guarding and the people are like, oh, it's because I'm, you know, the dogs are on the couch. Sometimes you get you get away with it, but you know. That being said, you do want to still make sure you do a good assessment in your work. Yeah, but that's really important too, though. I mean, not just from an applied perspective that you have some type of treatment package that really deals with all of the potential problems. So the the stimulus stimulus pairings, the the non learned the elicited components too and then the response mm -hmm. consequence components right so all these things that we've talked about that can be really relevant for producing aggression whether we're talking about you know unlearned reflexive uh respondent so learned reflexive elicited or operant aggression a treat any you might have a treatment package that handles all of those simultaneously mm -hmm. So even if you don't know what is causing, and I think that's very common in a lot of applied work, you have to, you just aren't going to have the kind of experimental control that, <laughs> that, that yeah. you know, I'm often looking for in, in papers that I work with. Um, mm -hmm. You just don't have that luxury. Um, and, uh, and that's understandable. So you have to think about what is, is, is this treatment going to account for all of these potential problems yeah speaking along those lines you want to talk about data data yeah. tracking yeah so, yeah. so oh, i was uh, not at all i hate data <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was listening to eddie on on, on a podcast he recently did with uh, hannah burn again and uh, they were talking about data and how difficult it is to to get clients to track data and, and or you know even get that to happen and i'm sure many of you guys are thinking the same thing like how do i get clients to do that and i i struggle with the same thing i, I will say that you know the approach i've taken is it depends on the client really you know you, some people you're just getting in there to to manage things and there's going to be no data tracking really because they're not even tra trying to do any kind of behavior change strategy and that's um that's a conundrum i face because i've i've said okay i could go with clients that i know are going to be very committed and participate and track data and all those things uh, but then i'm not going to be able to help a whole lot of other people because they need to maybe just the management of the situation so um, the clients that I have had track data um, usually have a background <laughs> doing something like that. So I've had uh, um, 
yep. you know, people with a background in ABA or, or some sort of uh, mental health profession or something where they, they understand the tracking or they have some understanding of science or they're kind of techie people. Um, but it's it's very difficult to to get them to consistently track data so you can do that. What I have found, though, is um, with the whole um, a boom of using Zoom and video and all of this stuff now is that it's opened a little gateway to using video. And I'm able to sometimes extrapolate data by getting the video sessions from the client that they send me as part of the the overall you know program that I'm doing with them. They're sending me video updates and I'm yeah. able to see some things going. Um, but even then, one of the conundrums you face is that also when you start teaching them about body language, so we're looking for a decrease in the frequency of a particular behavior, right? But with aggression, right? It's not like we're going to say, we're going to look at a decrease in the frequency of the dog trying to bite your face, right? They're not going to continue to try to track that. It might happen once, but you're not going to get a lot of data that's going to be very useful because they're managing the heck out of it. So um, it's because then we start teaching them about, you know, the dog's yawning or lip licking, so stress signals in the dog. And all of a sudden they're of those signals and all of a sudden it becomes a spike in an increase in frequency because they're seeing those things so they mm -hmm. think it's getting worse they're just getting better at reading the signals <laughs> so right. you can see all the, the issues i face so i'm happy to to hear what you have to say from your side of the perspective how we can make this easier as trainers and consultants <laughs> and and make you a millionaire because you're going to come up with the next app for <laughs> tracking data and pet pet homes yeah i i mean i i have like my elevator pitch within an elevator pitch of of this component so literally like it's like we have half a floor in the elevator for me to throw out my elevator pitch which is uh and part of it is what you just said the video that's an interesting uh and important component but really at the end of the day what we need is a program that everyone can have on their phone and that all you have to do is sit there and, and tap when you see this response boom 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 mm -hmm. and you're done that's what we ultimately need and every trainer uh would then be able to use that program um you know and i have by the way i should say i have no problem saying that that's what we need because anybody who thinks that they're going to just take that idea and then go out and produce the program <laughs> well you don't know how the behaviors have to be recorded and you know you got to come to me about all that so at the end <laughs> you don't have to but you, um, so I have, I have, uh, there's a lot more detail. The devil is in the detail for this, but at the end of the day, that's the simple answer is we need a, we need a basic program mm -hmm. that runs on a phone, runs on whatever, some simple device. It's right there. And you can tap a couple of things whenever you see these things. And that's especially important for, uh, uh, behaviors like what you're talking about, really rare events. Cause imagine how useful that would be for you if any those rare times that you may actually get the the most extreme version of aggressive behavior the actual attempt at the bite right that you're already saying well you might see that every rare now and then you know three mm -hmm. four times in working with a client imagine how useful that would be if you actually had that event recorded right at that moment when it occurred and you had maybe some video but in the least you had a time of day and you had the person immediately provide feedback when that happened about what else the dog did when it happened and then what they where it occurred the time of day and who was around all of these factors you just had all that recorded right there because yeah. the person just went tap 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 and done that would be uh, so. That's the that's the the simplest simplest answer is we need uh, a a device like that, a program, an an app that uh, we can record all these things. And and the tricky part now is what are what is it that we're having the app record? How are we having it record? How are we having it, uh, produce the data? Um, that's some of the stuff. Uh, so. Uh, you know, Hannah Brannigan and I have, have spent a bunch of time and Hannah and, and you were mentioning the, the, the podcast as well from Hannah's, you know, drinking from the toilet that uh, Ava and Emily and Hannah and I so that, you know, 
as, as I mentioned to you before, that's H plus E times three is <laughs> Hannah, Ava, Emily, and Eddie. Um, we're, we're the new Spice Girls, um, plus, <laughs> plus one Spice Boy. Um, so, um, that's, that's our band name, H plus E times three. Um, but uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about this. And Hannah had me do, we ended up, it was supposed to be a four week course and I turned it into a six week course for, for her zero to CD uh, group um, that we had a data collection uh, mm. uh, 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 course, that informal course that we did. Um, it, it was supposed to be four one hour courses and I couldn't, I couldn't stop. So it ended up being six, one and a half hour courses. <laughs> Uh, we had a lot of fun with it and we just ran through different data collection uh, mm -hmm. procedures um, because at the end of the day this is the one this is this is the this this is the light at the end of the tunnel for all practitioners for anyone dog consultants dog trainers anyone doing interested in any type of, of behavioral intervention all of applied behavior analysis all of applied behavior analysis outside of the, of the applied animal world is using data at almost every step of the way of what they do. So if you see that, you know, you see applied behavior analysts working in school settings, you see them working in organizations doing uh, organizational behavior management work, uh, you see autism therapy work, you see them working with developmentally disabled clients, it, it all of these things. Um, because there's so many different fields, they're using data. It is a it is part of the core definition of behavior analysis is the ability to analyze behavior, and to analyze behavior that means using quantitative data. So applied behavior analysis has been doing this for over half a century, figuring out ways to apply data. So we have all these things laid out uh, right there. For us to be, we just have to start transferring some of that information, some of that methodology into our world. But it's not, it, it, it's not impossible. It's already been done. It just hasn't been done necessarily uh, or not regularly with people's dogs. So, um, and it's funny because I've talked to some other people about this. In fact, uh, uh, Kiki Yablon brought up a really uh, important point along these lines where she said, well, it would be easy to say, um, I'm paraphrasing her and she'll probably, uh, she could, she would do a better job of saying this, but it would be easy to say, you know, you're dealing with, oh, well, but it's not the same what you're dealing with um, in this situation for an applied behavior an analyst in another situation because they're not dealing with euthanasia or, or, or something like that, right? So they're not, it's not a dog's life that's on the line, but you know, we could equally make the argument that, it, yeah, well, sure, it's only your child's future that's on the line and their progress in a school setting. So if you're looking at um, uh, different programs for uh, autism therapy could be the difference between whether this, uh, uh, in, some, in some cases, early intervention programs um, have been shown to be effective to, uh, to, to have, uh, get uh, children that can actually learn how to speak rather than just simply be echolalic. So it's literally lives of your children potentially on the line. So we can't make the argument that, well, but it's not as, you know, we're dealing with life or death situations. We have to intervene now. Yes, but applied behavior analysts have figured out ways to do this. So the optimistic component of that is that it's been done and we just have to figure out the ways to do it. I think I know the tool that we can use to do it, which is our phones. And uh, now we just have to get that level of training. And that training is coming about, hopefully, through some of uh, the, the course that I will be teaching when I'm in Australia, um, <laughs> the Applied Behavior Analysis with Animals course that I'm teaching through the vet school where, where I'm faculty at University of Adelaide. That's just something eventually we're going to offer online. So I, I hope that's where we're going in the, all of this is there. It's there in the future. So now the question is, what can we do right now for what can trainers do right now to start learning more about data, to start uh, uh, 
uh, learning how to, to measure or use data in yeah. some way. It, it, you know, we were talking about culture before and it's the cultural shift that's got to happen where um, there's a reason why it's so important to track data, you know, so because it's just like anything else, like people yeah. don't get help until their dog bites somebody and trainers aren't going to necessarily learn to track data until they realize it's actually a problem not to, especially if you're yeah. using ABA concepts, right? But yeah. so, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's definitely, I think, better, but I, there's a, yeah, there's a lot, not a lot that needs to be done uh, and it's got to be, it's got to be easy and efficient, just like anything else for anywhere. Um, so. That's one of the ab. Th there's two t things that I like to stress about this, and and I know, and I don't, I by any, you know, I am empathetic to this plight because I'm dealing with it every day. This is part of being yeah. a, being an applied behavior scientist and an applied animal behavior scientist. I'm stuck between two worlds, you know. I'm stuck between there's there's many scientists who who laugh at the kind of things that I do. They're like, that's not a real scientist, and then there's there's, uh, you know, practitioners going, yeah, but that's science. He's not a practitioner. <laughs> so I'm stuck between these two worlds, yeah. right? Um, so, and I know I, I'm empathetic to the plight of, oh yeah, it's easier said than done. Yeah, you, that is very much true. Um, but we, we can get there um, if we're getting there little bit by bit. Um, I like to say that any data is better than no data and no data are perfect. So there's no, there, there's no goal that we're going to achieve for this. We're not going to get somewhere uh, specific. Like it's not like we're not going to get to a point where we go and we're done. Now we're data experts. We're per we've perfected data collection. We're finally mm -hmm. done. There is no such thing as perfect data and any data is better than no data. So any approximation towards data collection is, is a movement in the right direction. So that's where I, I, I think we, we need to focus on. And then mm -hmm. aside from that, um, I think there are some simple uh, data collection procedures that, that we can do. And part of that is hopefully um, I and other people just start offering more coursework uh, about this, start offering more ability mm -hmm. for people to learn about data collection procedures that we can do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Easier, easier I mean, the way to that. yeah, the way to sell it is it's going to be a time saver for for trainers. Absolutely, you know? um, and it's funny that you mentioned. I actually, uh, I talked to, I've talked about that in the zoo world with training. Um, that training animals, investing. That's the part that I, I call it investing at that level, and it's the same thing for data. That it's data investment. Why do you invest? in general right you don't invest because you like not having money right you <laughs> right oh i didn't want to have money that i could spend right now you invest money because it turns into more money later on mm -hmm. right that's yep. uh, wow that was the probably the worst economic example <laughs> no, i like it actually it's, it's actually a great great analogy you know because right. you want yeah yeah, so yeah, we're investing yeah. in, we invest in the zoo world, we invest in training, because then it's it's less problem behavior later mm -hmm. down the road, mm -hmm. right? When we do get to encounter that time that uh, we're, we're saving time in the long run mm -hmm. by investing some time up front. And I think that's the case with data too. We have to invest in the data collection up front so that we can save time in terms of our effectiveness for interventions mm -hmm. and our ability our ability yeah. to accurately assess what's going on later on yeah yeah so, um, so i'll be waiting <laughs> <Bring that. laughs> I know. Uh, uh, one simple i, I would say a, a simple response everyone can i if you like this idea of doing more with data collection then we just this is you start asking for more of it that's another thing too so um for people that are i i don't know if if uh, if I'm going to offer another thing through zero to CD again um, with Hannah, but Hannah and I, we're going to be talking about it, of course, um, people seem to really enjoy it. So we need just more outlets. So I, I'll, I give seminars on data collection and things like that. So that's one simple answer, I guess, is start bugging people to get me to come out and train more people on you on collecting data for applied purposes. That's the best I get at selling myself. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> all your podcast interviews and everything will do that for you. Yeah. So, um, so do you want to take a few questions for, while we're while we've got a little time left? Or? Yeah, we spent okay. a lot of time talking about a lot of important stuff. Um, that's a really uh, yeah. Thank you for redirecting. <laughs> <laughs> So anyone have any questions off offhand? Yeah, anything on aggression or or ABA or yeah. Uh, Love to hear from you guys too. Yeah, while while we wait on, a, on someone typing like in. A Dina Dina raised her hand. I don't know if you want to unmute or how you want to. Oh usually do. yeah, we can, do, we can do that too. And I didn't have it set up. To, you can, I think you should be able to unmute if you want to unmute and uh, and we can go from there. Were you able Maybe, to? Yeah. Me, I think I, I think it was. I think you have to request that. That's uh, the way it was yeah. with me when I. It, and it was Danette, right? Uh, or... Dina. Dina oh. Hassan. Oh, there we go. Let me. I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling through. I have, uh, I have, the first person view on here, so that probably oh, okay. the most effective. There we go. Here we go. Okay, so I'm a non-trainer <laughs> yeah. with a behavior interest. I volunteer and foster with a foster-based rescue group. We also have a small shelter. Um, so obviously we sometimes get behavior issues. A lot of those behaviors are gonna fall under what's considered aggression. Um, sometimes straight out bites, we get returns from adopters, blah, blah, blah. How so we're very interested right now. We're working on a behavior program the best we can do without we don't have an actual trainer um, or behaviorist at this point that we're working with. What kinds of questions and data are we looking for? I mean, we can do the basics we all combined have enough knowledge of, and I'll say um force-free focus. Mm -hmm. of dealing with um, unacceptable behavior, say, to get dogs adopted. You know, how, how do we start thinking about what kinds of questions, how we're collecting this data? Because sometimes dogs move through very quickly and we have limited knowledge, but we remain a resource for the adopters as well as the fosters. Um, so this is going to be really important as we begin to develop more of a real uh behavior type program we get a lot of fearful dogs so yeah we get a lot of um some dogs are not doing well in a home with another dog but they've previously lived with other dogs so what's going on there and how do we start to figure that out so we can get help the dog while we have access to them and help them find the right home. And I'm not talking about severely aggressive, dangerous dogs. These are yeah. normal dogs that are, are pretty darn good dogs with some problems. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you for, for the um, question and, and also for being an advocate for the dogs and doing all the work you're doing. Um, and coming to this, you know, this is uh, you know kind of what I was gonna mention is how you start to, um, uh, learn to ask those questions or what questions you want to ask of, you know, the work you're doing and the behavior uh, of the dogs. Um, so, you know, you mentioned you don't have a trainer that you work with, but it's something you might consider is to find a, a trainer. We are, we are looking around and okay. we're trying to find one that even if Excellent. the best we can do is somebody who uses Lima, that you say, mm -hmm. we're staying on the least invasive side. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're not doing prongs. We're not doing shock. We don't see value in that. In rehabilitating dogs mm -hmm. um so that's something that we we're just kicking off a more detailed program excellent and that's you know somebody that can come in and help you on the behavior side of things you might also consider somebody that can look at the uh overall shelter aspect of things so, so somebody mm -hmm. like my colleague uh, trish mcmillan um, yes. she she runs a shelter um, course like uh, takes your soup to nuts through everything you'd want to know about like the procedures and protocols in a shelter environment including assessment and behavior and things like that uh, that'll i think help to continue make your 
program more robust and um, kind of answer some of the questions you're having that I can kind of uh, hear in what you're saying. Um, and, you know, and like anything else, it's going to be, you know, a matter of you, you learn from each dog, the experience of each dog and exactly. what's going to be most appropriate yes. for placement. But some guidance and some framework, you know, sort of what they call your SOPs or your, your protocols for what kind of dogs you're going to place or what the what the assessment's going to look like in your environment. All those things will, I think, uh, you know, again, from a shelter and rescue perspective, um, help the overall situation. Because once you have standard protocols in place, everything from how you're going to work with a certain behavior to how you're going to stay safe with a certain type of dog to the adoption protocols and what um, what dogs you're going to feel uh, comfortable adopting out given the policies of your shelter and the risk that your um, shelter mm -hmm. is taking with certain things. That's kind of going to give you the framework that's going to allow you to um, then go to even more in-depth um, eddy style data collection of all <laughs> what you're doing to see what's actually working. And what's going to come back to you is the data of which uh, which dogs are staying in homes longer and which types of homes are best for your particular community and the dogs that are coming into your shelter. Because each shelter is different depending on where you live and the demographics and the resources involved. So, um, yeah. And so you're you're heading in the right direction for sure. Just, you know, continue. With okay. Doing doing. Sometimes I'm in over my head. I've done a lot of learning over the last two or three I feel years. You. Yes. Um, yes. And I know one thing I, I can't go into this field like as a profession, <laughs> but um, I have learned a great deal of value There's from a lot. webinars yeah. like this. Three fourths may go over my head, but I've got a quarter of information that I can apply and use um, mm -hmm. right now. And yes. um, that's extremely helpful. That's that's how yeah. many of us start. <laughs> and it always, <laughs> it does feel very overwhelming, uh, especially for yeah. starting on. And if you've got the, the endeavor you've got going on. So kudos to you for, uh, you know, you. continuing to do what you do. Yeah. All we right, have so, another uh, question. Yeah. Uh, uh, so Danette's just uh, a... commenting. Yeah, and yeah, I was going to mention too, um, Dina, if you want to, you know, pop in your zip code, you might be able to find uh, some, some suggestions from somebody in the group. I know uh, there's some. Um, there's locator, trainer locator. So even if we don't know somebody, we can look it up to see who's in your area, uh, who has the right credentials you'd be looking for to for trainer uh, searches. Oh, uh, let's see. Claudia, like I think we had have a another question. Yep. Let me. Getting data from the customer is often difficult. You see it coming. Oh, I uh, just uh, I went to unmute Claudia. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, and then we'll go. We'll go. Or sorry, I went to unmute Kathy, uh, but let's okay. go with, let's start with Claudia and then Kathy, I think has okay. been unmuted. Okay, all right, all right, yeah, definitely. Uh, let me see, I guess I'll read this one. Sounds like more of a, a management type of question. So getting data from the customer is often difficult. They are stressed and didn't see it coming because uh, they did not uh, look at the dog when biting occurred. Uh, tips for management are not completely implemented for now. Uh, muzzle, dog is not touched by visitors, dog staying on her place and chew on something um getting her a fire guard what can i do books dvds about body language are there but the customer doesn't read it yes so um i think what you're mentioning is what many of us as trainers and consultants struggle with is the lack of participation what we used to call compliance i like to call it participation uh and and teamwork with the client. So I one of the things that I do right from the beginning is try to assess a couple of things is how much time they have to commit to it and custom tailor my uh, management suggestions and behavior change strategies based on that. Um, and also their learning uh, style. So how do they like to learn? Do they like to see things? Do they like to read things? Um, and that's important because uh, if I want to get things through to them as efficiently as possible, I want them to digest the information I'm giving them as efficiently as possible. So I'll ask them, like, how do you like to learn things? Do you like to read? Do you like to watch videos? Would you rather see me do it, demonstrate on your dog if it's safe to do so? And uh, that's going to give you some inroads to the fastest highway of information there. And then structure your program accordingly. So with this particular client, you might say, okay, I'm maybe giving too much for them to tackle. So let me focus on 
triaging what's most important for management, what's going to keep that client most safe, while also uh, reducing the most stress for that dog. So we, can we change the environment that's going to only require one, one time to actually implement that and then the work is done? Can we make it that easy for the client? Um, like feeding the dog in a separate room if it's a dog guarding the food bowl. Simple management switch fixes the issue in many cases. Um, and then build on that. So start with the most important thing. And then as the client is successful in that one endeavor, tack something else on. Uh, because what can happen is if we give them too many things at once is that it becomes information overload and also just task overload. And so they take a step back and say, uh, it's just too much for me to handle. It gets frustrating and so on. And then it gets frustrating for you as the trainer and consultant. So just a couple little tips there in terms of what we can do to, to, to streamline things. It's, it's almost, that's why I said it's the people. It's custom tailoring it to their, their how they learn, how they like to part, how much they're going to participate. And Claudia, I will say also, and to all the other trainers here, is try to avoid the 80, 20, 90, 10 approach to things, meaning if we're giving 80 or 90% of our effort and we're getting 10 or 20% in return, that is the fastest road to burnout and compassion fatigue in our industry. So try to balance that. If just you, you let your client know, I'm here for you. I'm here for you, what you need, but um, I need the participation in return. So it's like, I like to call it the 51-49 rule. I give it 51% of my effort. If I get 49% return, I'm going to be there for them. But if you start doing that 80-20, 90-10, it's, it's going to really take its toll over time. So... Um, so if you're feeling frustrated, take a step back and maybe just assess, you know, where that client is at with you. Uh, and don't be afraid to, you know, sever that relationship if you need to for your own health. So just my little uh, comments on that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Kathy to unmute. She's got a question. Hi, thank you for putting this on first off. Yeah. This is great. Um, yeah. I have a question about some resource guarding, a case I'm working on with a virtual client um, where it's guarding a crate space in particular. Um, and I'm worried about the generalization of her guarding behavior towards the other dogs. Um, so with this setup, it's in, we actually tried to remove the crate because outside of the crates, they're fine move the crate to a different room, but it actually spiked the dog's anxiety. Um, so while she's connecting with a vet behaviorist, um, which unfortunately takes forever now, <laughs> um, I'm having her work with a, basically training a new place behavior to create a more neutral location mm -hmm. to then work with desensitization and counter conditioning to fit in the space that she has in her home. But is there anything I should be really cognizant of as far as the dog then beginning to guard that space and that space increasing in value and becoming something she guards more. So this is dog to dog directed, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so one thing to assess for is how much the barrier is causing the issue. So confinement or restriction of movements can be restricting some options, some sort of choice and control on, on the environment. And so um assess for that maybe to see if there's any history of does the dog do have a more difficult time behind barriers like crates or fences or baby gates or you know anything like that uh, because that'll give you a big part of the answer is okay if we teach this dog a place cue or uh, with the option to get up and move away from the dog so a flight option uh, mm -hmm. if that's what's what's being because so of the motivation then that's one one particular aspect. Now to answer the other question is, yes, you can increase the value of a particular area, especially if it's got a rich history of reinforcement. So if I'm teaching a place cue, then reinforcing, reinforcing for going on that mat, suddenly that mat could have a lot of value. So you do wanna be careful with that as well. Um, so what you can do to mitigate some of those concerns is not ha necessarily uh, have a particular location that um, you're using for stationing or to keep the dog, but use other management techniques for now until you can unpack some of those other things. So can you separate the dogs with a much larger space? So that way that particular uh, dog you're focusing on isn't going to say, all right, I'm in my crate. So barrier game on, or I'm on my super awesome place that I've been reinforced heavily for. If you take away those aspects, then you're actually changing the environment enough to uh, reduce the likelihood of the behavior. So um, those are just some of the things I would look at. There, 
there could be other things going on, but I would need more history in the case. Um, but that's kind of the, the most common uh, things to look for and what you're describing there. So uh, switch up the, the enclosure or the, the, the barrier first, and then um, you could t potentially do place training, but look at how much, uh, where the environment is. I would say that the most critical aspect though is making sure the dog you're working with doesn't feel like the other dogs are a threat to that particular resource in any way. Because even if, you know, you can train a dog to stay in a place really well, but that doesn't change the underlying reason for the behavior, right? The dog's never gonna be like, I feel totally safe here and nobody's ever gonna touch my stuff. You can put that behavior change plan in place. You can do classical counter conditioning, other dogs approaching predict good things for you on this mat or in your crate, but that you've got to rule out those other things first. Does, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, definitely. I think what makes it tough is she feeds them separately and the dog's behind a, a gate and has no issues. So I think it is specific to that crate setup, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, that's, those are some great tips. So I'll explore that with her. Great. Good. We have any other questions? What think my, my uh, AirPods are starting to run low here. So let me switch up to uh, just my regular. Sure. Mic. Oh, yeah, Natasha had a, a question here. Um, Natasha was asking about uh, correlation between nutrition and increasing omega-3s. Uh, to help reduce aggression, I uh, ask about any data proving or disproving. I I know nothing about any type of research link or any any correlation, any any research in this area at all. So I I cannot say anything about it. Um, so I, I can know. comment a tiny bit. Again, I agree with Eddie. There's just not a lot of data on all research. Can you hear me, okay, Eddie? I, I switched yeah. my mic. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the there's some um, whispers about omega threes and the impact on behavior, but nothing that I've seen definitively come out in terms of hard data that says, yeah, omega threes are going to change behavior, because there's just so many other factors involved when it comes to nutrition. We could start talking about impacts on the microbiomes and behavior, and that's a fascinating topic on its own. The gut microbiomes and you know how much serotonin <laughs> resides there. And then even can, I was talking to um, uh, Am Amber Batson, Dr. Amber Batson, who's really into the biome uh, topic and how much the skin microbiome also affects the gut microbiome, which affects the behavior of the dog. Um, so there's, there's lots of interesting conversation. So in, in that regard, the amount of data or research on nutrition and aggression is just very small. There's like back in you know the, the, the tryptophan protein content study that came out that was in the 80s or 90s with Nick Dodman and his team, mm -hmm. and a couple other small but small sample size. So the short answer to the question is the jury's very much still out on nutrition and impacts on behavior and uh, let alone aggression because it's hard to study aggression, right? I mean most aggression studies that you read out there with canines or dogs, the family dogs, is that it, it's it's owner questionnaire, owner surveys. And because it's very, it's, ethically speaking, it's very difficult to study dogs who bite people. You know, nobody's signing up for a study on dogs who like try to bite your Yeah. Face. So it's, tough, it, tough, it's a tough one to study without um, all the other factors that can impact behavior. Right, and, and from a survey perspective, and without some experimental design, which is incredibly difficult to run, uh, the surveys themselves are already going to be prone to observer bias. So that's an important component. Um, I will note that uh, one thing that's really relevant, particularly with any behavioral studies in general, and, and looking for attributing factors for behavior. So when we're looking at anything, whether we're talking about medication, uh, nutrition, any component that we're trying to suggest might produce some effect that's related behaviorally. The science, the general scientific perspective is to be skeptical. So that is skepticism is a necessary scientific requirement. That doesn't mean denial, 
That doesn't mean, so like when I, when I said, I don't know of any research, I can't say one way or the other. I, that doesn't just because I don't know anything about uh, this topic. I don't know about any relation to aggression, but what it does mean is I'm going to remain skeptical because I don't know of anything. So I'm going to say, well, I need evidence to show me that there is some type of correlation between omega threes and aggression. Otherwise, I'm going to play the the. Uh, I'm going to take the safe bet and remain skeptical that there is any type of correlation. Such a good, such a good point. You know, to be skeptical about anything that we're reading, it's like the hypothyroidism um, trend right. that was going around ten years ago, maybe. Um, but yeah. all of a sudden, all aggression, check for thyroid. You know, any aggression, check for thyroid. Check for thyroid. Right. And the What's happened is that actually very, very, very small percentage of cases actually resolved any kind of aggression with the, the you know, addressing hypothyroidism or just, just sub hypothyroid dogs, you know, and previously everything was blamed on that, like, oh, that's got to be hypothyroidism, but not the case once we start looking at the data more with a more scrutiny, right? So. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, I think Dodman was involved in some of the research there too, as well as some, of, I don't remember what one of the treatments was, but there was someone recently who was asking me about some of this uh, relationship between um, hyperthyroidism and um, and aggression. And I, I, I just briefly looked at a couple of the papers. And one of the things I found astounding was the fact that one of the papers actually found no results in support of particular this, uh, I don't remember what the, the typical treatment was. I'm speaking really generally about this, but but still the argument was, and therefore this is why we still want to push forward with this treatment, which I, I was surprised that it was like, wait a second, you found no effect, but you're still arguing for this uh, drug to treat hyperthyroidism to be used as a drug to reduce aggression even though you're finding no evidence for this. So I didn't, so I'm, again, uh, all of this is to say that I think the, the proper response is to remain skeptical, um, to say, you need to show me the evidence. And then on top of that, I am, I am particularly skeptical of any time someone wants to say, yeah, but you know what, I can just go ahead and, and use this thing um, as a treatment, because it's not really going to do any harm. Like there's no harm, no foul, it's fine. But there's time investment and that itself is harm. So if somebody says something like, well, I'm just going to use this essential oil or I'm just going to use this, uh, uh, whatever it is um, that I know there's no evidence for it. I know there's no evidence for this thing, but I'm, I'm, I feel fine with advocating for it because it's not going to cause any harm. That's still uh, an investment. That is still, you're asking for people's trust in something and you can destroy trust. So we have to be skeptical and, and particularly, uh, the CBD um, oils thing is another new component too, of course. And, uh, and, and there have been a couple, uh, there's one particular study published not too long ago, which was particularly not good methodologically uh, looking at uh, uh, use of CBD oil. Um, and, and there wasn't enough discussion about, the, there are some people taking that for granted. It's, oh, look, 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 this is, this is effective. Uh, this is an effective uh, uh, behavioral treatment for, um, uh, I'll, I'll have to throw in this reference, but there were some glaring methodological problems. This was published in scientific reports, um, some, Italian researchers, and they're, they're, they did a great job. I, I understood what they were trying to do, and I talked with the Italian researchers. I just can't remember the, 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 the name of the author, the, the first author that I was talking with, but there was still a, there was still a very glaring methodological issue that they didn't account for. So, um, and, it, and it completely threw the, the, the potential validity of their results out the window. So, we have to be, um, skepticism is the name of the game for science. Yeah. Any, any last, I guess we, we have probably time for one more question if there's one more. Um, and then I think we're gonna. 
See, I even got to put in some input on a question that was aggression related. I, I, know. I told you I'd be picking your brain. <laughs> I wouldn't. Have. I have to throw the disclaimer out at least like every 15, 20 minutes that my uh, I, I do nothing. <laughs> research it's, it's the reason I do my podcast is so I can learn from the other person and, you know, like talking to you, you know, you always learn something yeah. when you're doing these interviews and these chats. So, you know, I appreciate, I certainly appreciate the opportunity and uh, being able to learn from your insight as well. So, yeah, no, absolutely. This has been wonderful. This has really opened my, my eyes to a lot more um, uh, relevant uh, components to dog aggression in general. Yeah. Um, there we go. Claudia has one, uh, safety tips for, uh, first contacts with Western and fighting dog. Um, I do a whole weekend seminar on this topic. Actually it's, um, it's, but, uh, two layers of safety. That's the, the rule of thumb for me. If the dog has a bite history, whether it's a Chihuahua or a great Dane, two layers of contact, because you don't want to put another bite into that dog's history ethically and from a safety and risk and consequence standpoint. There's so many reasons you don't want to get bitten by client's dog. So uh, if you have two layers of safety, whether it's a dog's been acclimated to a muzzle and somebody's holding a leash or the dog's behind a fence with a back tie, something that's called, it's like a long line attached to something very sturdy, where you have basically two things to keep you safe in case one layer fails, because sometimes the dog surprises you. They jump over a six foot fence or they pop the muzzle off. So you at least have that other layer of contact there. Um, and you do that his by getting a little historical data on the, the bite history. Clearly, you don't want to meet the dog in the same context in which the dog typically bites. You don't want to put the dog in a position that they feel compromised for their own safety. So you want as much freedom of movement and ability to escape if they want as possible. Um, and uh, also watch what you're doing in terms of how you approach the dogs, so your own body language, what you're doing with the food, how you're moving, all of those things um, can make a significant impact on how the dog responds to you. So uh, the rule of thumb is to make the dog as most comfortable with your arrival as possible. And that uh, can be determined through, you know, again, the the conversation you have with the client before you get there. So have that, make sure you have that conversation before you don't just show up blind because uh, it's the best way to get bitten. Um, so yeah, set things up ahead safety wise and then uh, two layers of safety. Yeah, very good. Um, all right, I think that's where we're gonna call it. Um, oh, well, that was the uh, Joe Edwards asked for an update on Australia. I guess I'll end there. Uh, <laughs> for my input. We don't know. The Australian borders are still not open. So I am still stuck in the States. Um, I'm a year into my faculty position and I am still stuck in the States and, uh, and we don't know when we can get me there. So it's, it's, it's a process. Um, there's no light at the end of the tunnel yet, but we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, that's my update for Australia. I will be in Australia soon for any of my Australian friends that are watching this. We'll get me there eventually. You gotta let me know because I'm gonna head out there in 2022, early on, early 2022 for a, for a little seminar tour. So yeah, oh. if you're out there, we'll if you're out there, we'll definitely hang out. Well, it, it you know we're gonna have to hope the borders are open for both yeah. of us then because yeah. uh, I, I we think that the borders may open up by the end of the year that. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's got to be opened up for travel and for visas. So mine is is just getting the visa um, at this point. So yeah. which I think is going to be maybe a bigger hurdle than travel. So you could still get there and I could still not be there. So, um, but yeah, no, this was really wonderful. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, so uh, yeah, and then especially thank you Michael for for doing this. Was this was fantastic? Um, you know. Uh, a lot of great information um, and really important stuff. So I look forward to getting to do more of this uh, in the future. And Michael, we're going to keep talking because I think we've got some interesting stuff about data that we can talk about. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks everybody for joining and for sticking around for two hours too. Two, two hours <laughs> and two. Really appreciate that as well. So uh, good positive reinforcement for us. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, stop recording. There. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Again.